Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the oral history of Sam or Psalm, however you want to just, uh, pronounce it. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mary Ann Felice, and it is my uh, privilege uh, to now be in charge to moderate the oral history project, as we call it, that was actually started um, by Dr. Richard Brown, whom we will be interviewing next year in Austin, Texas. And those of you who know that I just started doing this last year, we started with Abigail English, who is in the audience now. And this year, for 2013, it's my real honor um, to present to you the history of Dr. Evelyn Eisenstein. And Dr. Eisenstein is a, um, a long-standing member of SAM. We believe she joined in 1976. But we're not sure because in those days there were no dates on the certificate <laughs> that you received. But Evelyn is a member of our international community, um, and she has been active all over the world, including the United States, in advocacy for adolescents. And I think you will find, as I did when I interviewed her by Skype and reviewed all of her documents that she sent me, uh, that she's had a fascinating career. Furthermore, Evelyn, being just a tad obsessive-compulsive like the rest of us, <laughs> has brought with her a suitcase full of documents, books, and everything to prove, I think, that she's actually done all the things that we're going to be talking about. I've never seen so many certificates in my entire life as I have uh, from Dr. Eisenstein. So let us start with the fact that um, she was born in Rio de Janeiro. Yes, I'm a Brazilian. Brazilian, not Argentinian. Everybody keeps coming up to her asking her about the new pope. And uh, <laughs> she's also Jewish, so when they ask her about the pope and it's not from her country, you know, she has a certain answer. But tell us, tell us about your family, your mother, your father, your siblings in Rio, and how did they end up in Rio? Okay. Uh, first, it's an honor to be here. And... Uh, I was the first generation of Brazilians. My father is Austrian, was Austrian, and my mother uh, from Germany, Breslau, that's nowadays something called Wroclaw. And they were immigrant Jews that were persecuted and came to Brazil, and they married in Brazil. So I was the first generation, and my brother, I have one older brother. One older brother, is he still alive? My brother is still alive and has four children. And actually now one of his girls have a granddaughter, <coughs> uh, has a daughter. So I am a, a great aunt. Grand aunt. Great aunt, uh, yes grand you are. Aunt. So in your early career, um, I know that you went to the University of the State of Rio de Janeiro and you combined that with both medical school and university, right? As I recall, that's when you became interested in adolescence and adolescent medicine. Can you tell us how that came about and what you were doing? Okay, well, being born in a Jewish family, the thing I did most of the time was reading. I was, uh, up to now, <coughs> I'm a book reader. So I used to read a lot. That's the first thing. Then I was a Girl Scout in Brazil. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And we deal with, with so Girl we Scout. used to do you know, groups and I think group therapy <coughs> and all of that. So <coughs> then I went to medical school. When I went to the third year of medical school, when you start doing clinical work in the wards in, in Rio, we had a, a huge wards, uh, 30 people in a big ward. And there were only women and men wards. So the teenagers used to stay between the adults because they were big enough, they could not go to the pediatrics. Pediatrics had only cots, uh, little cots. So, so I was very impressed with them. And I started uh, talking to them, and then I would take some of a group and go to the garden of the hospital. 
And then a nurse, Nalva Pereira Caldas, uh, she was very impressed and she gave me a room in the hospital. So I, we used to do what I now know it's a group therapy because I used to, to play with them, draw with them, talk with them, and so on. And then what happened, one of those boys had schistosomiasis, and he had who had a, a, a spleen surgery, and he got psychotic after the surgery. And so the boy who was talking after the surgery, he was completely out. And that impressed me very much. So I, I learned that way how teenagers would be very traumatized in the hospitals. And I decided to, to, to study that a little bit more. And then what happened, uh, we had a, a chief of psychiatry, psychiatry, and he invited me to, to, to start working on, with that hospitalized teenagers. And I produce, I was a, <laughs> and show, I was six year medical student, so the last year of medical student, I produced the first paper. <laughs> the first paper. <laughs> Uh, that was uh, uh, reviewing all the hospitalized teenagers, and those were 534 teenagers. And we, we talked about what happened in she Brazil. She was 23 years old when she did that study <laughs> yes. and uh, published it. Yeah, because I graduated, I was 24. Yeah, exactly. So that's how it all started. And then there and was... Then you had a communication with Dr. Bob Maslin from Children's Hospital Boston. How did that come about? Well, that's a very nice story. Well, I was a student, I was graduating, and so one day, one of the physicians of the hospitals, <coughs> Dr. Jensen, showed to me a book, and he said, Evelyn, there is uh, people in the United States working with adolescents, and that was the Medical Clinics of North America of March 65. So I, you know, he was very nice. The book is up to now signed by him, and he gave me the book. So I look at the book, and there was Dr. Roswell Gallagher. And I was very impressed. I said, well, if there are some people at Harvard doing this, I am not so crazy. <laughs> so. Wait, those are two different things, Evelyn. Well. <laughs> those are two different issues. But I was crazy enough, and I, there was here, chief, the adolescent unit, Harvard, and I, I wrote a letter to Dr. Gallagher. And naturally, Dr. Gallagher did not answer me, but Dr. Maslin, Bob Maslin, was very nice. And a day I received this letter with the red Harvard University. It was a <gasps> emotion. And it was Dr. Maslin, and he was very nice. And he said there, he has a five-day course in the United States. And if I would like to come and and I was very impressed with that. And then, and then I came to United States, but not really because of that, but because at that point I was married to Gerson. Oh, yes. And Gerson wanted to do a, a master in public health. So he applied to Harvard, he applied to Hopkins. And we went first to Boston. And because of that, I decided, well, then, if I'm in Boston, I will do the course. So I did the Harvard Medical. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps every CME course she has ever taken in her entire life. What year was that? That, that, that has a date. Uh, May 6, 1974 to May 10, 1974. So I did the five-day course. I remember Jean Emmons was pregnant at that point. I remember that. 
Anyway, uh, so I did the course, but then <coughs> Gerson decided to go to Baltimore for his public health study. And Dr. Bob Maslin was very nice and said, well, if you go to Baltimore, uh, look for Dr. Felix Hild. Oh, for Dave Barnes, was it? For Dave? No, oh, he, he said, for, look for Felix Hild. Ah, okay. So I looked for Felix Hild. Dr. Felix Hild was very busy, and he said, yes, nice meeting you. He did. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went back to Hopkins. <laughs> So I went for, back the, for those of you who don't know now, Dr. Heald was at the University of Maryland, Maryland, and Gersten was accepted in the public health program at Hopkins. Hopkins. One's on the east side of Baltimore, the other's on the west side of Baltimore. Yes. So I went to Hopkins Children's Hospital. I look at the elevator. At the elevator was a sign, adolescent unit, eighth floor. So I went up to the eighth floor. I did not know Dr. Barnes, but I knocked at his door and I said, I'm a Brazilian doctor. I work with adolescents. May I join you? <laughs> and I think he thought I was very crazy. <laughs> but anyway, he was very polite. And he said, yes, you can participate at grand rounds. But I remember he said, you cannot touch any patient. So I would go to the grand rounds like this. <laughs> I did. I was very respectful. And then he said, well, you need to do the American internship. And then, and only then you could touch a patient, talk to a patient, so on, so on. So I went to do the at that point called ECFMG mm -hmm. ex exam. I did pass. It was a whole day exam. I passed. And then I had to do the internship again. So I went to the Greater Baltimore Medical Center. And we have a certificate for that. And too. I have a certificate for that. <laughs> for and that was July 74 to June 75. Now, to, those, to, those of you who don't know Dr. Verdane Barnes, Dr. Barnes was actually in, trained in internal medicine, but did endocrinology, including pediatric endocrinology. And he was originally at Hopkins, also doing adolescent medicine. He is a past president of SAM. And, uh, and then moved on. I know you'll, you'll okay, mention that. Okay, so, and he was a lot of, so, well, then after I did a whole year of internship, and you remember internship surgery again and blah. Anyway, so after a whole year of sacrifice, I went back to Dr. Barnes and said, yes, I completed my internship. May I have the fellowship at Hopkins to work with you? And he was very nice. And he said, Evelyn, I have a good news and a bad news. Which one do you want first? <laughs> I said, I want the good news. And he said, well, you were accepted as a fellow at Hopkins. And I was so, and then he said, but I'm leaving Hopkins. <laughs> so I worked for a whole year, and I couldn't understand that. So, but he was very nice. So he linked me to pediatric endocrinology. And it was very nice because I had all my training with Dr. Claude Mijon. Dr. Leslie Plotnik, Georgiana Jones, and John Money, who I don't know if you all remember, mm. was on the psychohormonal. He was the this, this psychiatrist. So it was a, a, another way to learn a little bit more about growth and development, something I liked very much. And well, and then the second year came by. And Dr. Mijon was very polite, and he said, well, Evelyn, the first year is the fellowship is clinical work, the second year is research. Would you be interested in working with estrogen receptors and tall stature in girls? And I said, what shall I do with that when I go back to Brazil with that? <laughs> you know? But 
you know, you need the job. So I said, okay, I will do. So I was accepted for a second year at fellowship at Hopkins, and then I got pregnant. And actually, we, we knew that we were going to go back to Brazil next year. So that was okay. I was pregnant. I had the fellowship at Hopkins. And exactly, exactly two weeks later, Dr. Felix Hilt called Dr. Mijon and said, is this Brazilian lady still there? <laughs> So Dr. Mijon was very nice and polite, and he said, yes, Evelyn, I know that you are interested in adolescent medicine. Dr. Felix Hill just called me. If you were, I think you should really go to have an interview. So I did go again to have an interview. And then what happened? <laughs> what happened is, is I wa Dr. Hilt was very nice. I was already pregnant. Anyway, in the beginning of pregnancy, and he offered me the, the fellowship. And I was going to go back to Brazil anyway, so that was okay. But then the fellow he selected did not show. And the older fellow was Dr. David Namoro. I don't know how many of you know mm. Dr. David Namoro. <laughs> Dr. David Namoro. <laughs> decided to show me University of Maryland Hospital. And he was working in the lab with a research on alcohol and pubertal growth at those times. And he was, well, shopping mice, lab, lab mice. Lab mice. Lab mice, the, the, the tail, because I don't know if you all know, <laughs> the, the, the growth of the mice, it's it by their tail. Anyway, I did not know that. But anyway, I went to the research <laughs> lab. <laughs> and then David Nemo, very polite and very nice, just shocked it. <laughs> I could almost faint. He's pregnant, remember? <laughs> I'm pregnant, and the guy is shopping that right. So I went back to Dr. Hilda and I said, thank you very much. You were very nice, but I cannot accept this position. <laughs> and he said, why really? And I said, I cannot shop. <laughs> so Dr. Hilda was furious with David Rammer and said, no, you don't have to go to the lab. So I said, okay, just to do the clinical work, I, I, I like teenagers, I relate well, okay, so, so I was accepted. And so for me, it was an honor to really be with Dr. Felix Hilt, who I knew was a precursor and for whom don't, this was a postgraduate course in adolescent medicine, March 72, that he showed me, you know, anyway. <laughs> And, and Marianne Feliz, and David Nemer, who was more respectful of me afterward. And that's, <laughs> and that's how I learned. And, and it was a wonderful year. It, I was pregnant, but you know, I was every day in the outpatient. You were, you were. Uh, with Brenda Reynolds, Teen, Dr. Hilde had the, the teenage pregnancy, the first clinic, I remember, in North America. And I used to study. I went to the library, and it was a, a happy year. You know, we, we used to go to Lexington Market, which you all know Baltimore, and had sandwich, but it was a wonderful year. And I learned a lot. And, and you also had a baby. Yeah, and then Domenica was born. <laughs> Domenica was born, and I had my 15 days uh, absence leave, but then I bribed Gerson, and I said, listen, I'm going to stay for the second year of my fellowship. Finally, I'm working with Dr. Hill, Dr. Marianne Feliz. I'm going to stay, and Gerson said, oh, we said we're going back, and he said, I, I'm going to stay. So I, I decided Dr. Hill because 
uh, the fellowship ends in July, that I was not going to take vacation, so I would go uh, by June. So that was one month. And we asked uh, a Brazilian maid to come and help me. So uh, this Brazilian maid came and I was telling Marianne, I used to breastfeed a doctor Hughes office <laughs> because I need to pump the milk. So there. So he was wonderful. But everything he happened. He was not in the office. No. <laughs> he did this. No, he was in not all the fairness office. to Dr. Hield, I want to make that very clear yes. to everybody. But in yes. the private place that you could yeah, go. Yeah, but he was always very supportive. He was. He, he was. Loved uh, he was he very loved supportive. Evelyn. No question. So then when did you go back to Brazil? Okay, then uh, finally we, we did go back to Brazil, 78, 79. 79, I went back to Brazil. And all that work that I had started there continued. And Dr. Maria Helena Ruzani, who had come from United States <laughs> for training in pediatrics, she rotated, uh, she did not do a fellowship in adolescent medicine, but she rotated, so she knew something. She was at, at Montefiore or Sinead in New York, anyway. So she continued that work, and as soon as I returned, I went to be part of the team. At that point, we call Unidade Clínica de Adolescente, Adolescent uh, Unit. And we start working, and we got a fellow, and so on. And at that point, we had to convince the Pediatric Society of Brazil that adolescent existed, because mm -hmm. they only deal with children up to age 12. So we had some meetings, and, and then life tur takes turns around. And I met this wonderful lady doctor, Dr. Veronica Coates, who is sitting here. Yes. Dr. Veronica Coates was from Sao Paulo. And I was from Rio. So I said, Veronica, Veronica is a pioneer in Brazil, she, not only in adolescent medicine, but she did the first better child oh. syndrome <coughs> paper. She knows everything, and she keeps and don't give her anything because she keeps it all. Yeah. And uh, so we we start, and and I was always against violence. So I, I w connected immediately with Veronica, and we start trying to convince. And Veronica, Veronica is always taller than me, and I would say, Veronica, you go to those tall Brazilian doctors and say from your height, <laughs> adolescent exists anyway. So finally, in 1985, we did put together the first Brazilian Congress of Adolescents. And here's a picture, that's a photo. You know, many of the people are not here anymore, but anyway, uh, Veronica and myself and, <laughs> and all the group. So this was 1985. Now by then you had your second child, though. Oh, yes. So By would then you at least mention your second oh, child? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, well, what happened? I came back from Brazil. I came back to work. But Brazil, at that point, very different culturally. There was no women to work. It was very complicated <coughs> family-wise. And I had to go to the hospital. And Gerson's family, very Catholic, very, you know, women have to be home with the baby, and Dominica was small. And I decided, for whatever reason, I'm going to have a boy. <laughs> and I have a boy, and I, had, I got pregnant again. So I got pregnant, and Mateus was born. A boy, how did you decide I'm having a boy and you had one? And I had the boy and Mateus was born and four weeks later, Gerson split the marriage mm -hmm. and I had Mateus four weeks and Domenica four years and a whole career. And I, I think I got a little bit more crazy <laughs> at that point. And I remember 
calling back on the phone, not only to Dr. Hill, I got him on the phone, and I got, because, let me go back, at that point, when I was at University of Maryland, I had a psychiatric supervisor named Dr. Theodor Kaiser, who was a wonderful person. And once a week, we would be supervised. So I called back Dr. Kaiser, because in my head, I had all the family has to be, anyway. And I called back Dr. Kaiser, I was crying, and I, and, and he couldn't understand what I was saying. I'm calling from Brazil. And I said, just left, just left. And he said, Evelyn, are you hearing? Are you hearing? Just keep nursing, keep nursing. <laughs> I remember he saying so. Keep nursing. And I said, what's he saying, nurse? I'm not a nurse. <laughs> I know. I, and I, I didn't understand breastfeeding and nursing. You know, at that point. But anyway, so how important that was for me because it was the bond with Mateus. So I, I kept really breastfeeding Mateus for six months. And, and so slowly I got things back. So talking about Mateus and Domenico. Now Mateus is 32 years. He's in Miami. And Domenico is 36. I brought a photo. If you want to see, they are, they survived. They survived <laughs> pediatric. I'm going to tell you just one thing, okay? Being an, an adolescent specialist, it's not easy to, you know, I know there is the career and, you know, the career and, and. so I noticed Dominica's was growing and I knew she was going to be getting to be a teenager. So one day I talked to her and I said, listen, your breast buds and you are going to have pubic hair, blah, blah, blah. And I talked everything I knew to talk to my daughter. I, one night I'm, we are having dinner and she looked at me and said, you are an idiot. <laughs> I said, what? What's that, Domenica? That's disrespectful. Go to your room. So she goes to the room, then I go to the room, and I said, Dominica, what's that? Why are you so disrespectful? And she was crying and said, you said I was going to have breast butt and pubic hair, and nothing happened. Now look here, and she does like this. <laughs> she started with axillary here. <laughs> I said, how could that happen to me? <laughs> I remember. I said, why the variation with my daughter? You know, normal variation. But besides having two children, being a single mother, raising them, having a career in a country that didn't value or recognize necessarily a woman such as such as you doing everything you did, you managed to get a master's degree and a doctor of science. Could you just Talk to us a little bit about how you did that. Okay. Well, then there was, uh, I kept working, and I, there was, uh, in Rio, we had uh, someone who was almost a governor, who was Darcy Ribeiro, who was a wonderful person. <coughs> and Darcy Ribeiro decided to do a school health program for Rio de Janeiro. And uh, through the university, I was invited to, to participate in the school health program. So uh, at the end of three years of the school health program, I had 17,000 heights and weights, arm circumference, head circumference, of the school children who would enter the program. Those are, were very poor children who was entering the program. So with all this data, I decided to do a master of growth. And I asked again Dr. Hilt. Dr. Hilt was very nice, sent me a letter. I think you were not there anymore. He sent me a letter, invitation letter, and with that letter, I got a research grant to come back to the United States. 
Mateus was very small, I think he was five or six years old, and I went back with all this data, but at that point, we did not have computers in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So, se you know, can you imagine 17,000 heights and weights? People didn't even not talk about body mass index. We did height sure. and weight. Sure. Per sure. Okay, anyway. So Dr. Hughes was very nice again, and I came back to University of Maryland as a visiting professor, and he helped me at doing the statistical analysis of all that data, and I stayed there for three months. Mateus asked me to bring him back a skateboard. Mm -hmm. You know, he yeah. thought, this, anyway, so, I kept at Irene's house, anyway. So I was doing the data, and then when we were finishing, Dr. Hughes said to me, but Evelyn, you have to reference that. I said, reference? Yes, you have to show the malnourished, you know, malnutrition. So I said, well, how, how can I reference? There is no gross data in Brazil. Nobody knows about that. And he said, one moment, he took the phone, at that point we took the phone. He took the phone and talked to someone in Washington at NCHS. NC, no. NC yeah, the gross, the gross. Oh yes, NCHS, the, 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 the gross yes, chart. The gross studies. The gross studies. And he said, there is a Brazilian dog mola. And the guy was so nice and polite, he sent me all the whatever. So the statistician at University of Maryland put everything in that computer and I had a reference. <coughs> so I could reference the growth of Brazilian 17,000 with American standards. And that's the way I could prove they were malnourished and that was my master. So, and again, I, not only I own to Dr. Hill this opportunity, but that's the best part. At that point, we had, it was very difficult to do scientific review literature. So, Dr. Hill gave me like a credit card that I would put in the machine, in the Xerox machine, and I could go to the library and I would review everything. So at the end of three months, I had a pile of papers. <laughs> so I, Irene was very nice. She gave me a card box. I put all those papers and the skate. And the skateboard. The skateboard. The skateboard. And I went back to Brazil. At the customs, the guy asked me, <laughs> what you have in the box? And I said, papers. The guy did not believe. He said, take it out. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I said, I, I went to my state. Uh, he said, take it out. So he's the police. I took it out. And it was only papers and papers and paper and the skate. And Mateus was on the other door waiting for me. So and then the guy said to me, yeah, you were right. It's only papers. Now you put it back. And I said, at that point. <laughs> I'm not going to put it back. You did re not respect me. You put it back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wonder, was crazy. crazy. So wonder you weren't arrested. And you know, I was <laughs> arrested right there. Anyway, but that's why I did the master, and then I decided to do to my doctorate. What happened to the malnourished children? And, and I asked again to Dr. Hilde, I don't have food to give to them. And Dr. Hilde was so, he knew exactly, he was the real mentor. He said, Evelyn, it's the bonding, remember? Connectedness, what now we say connectedness. So I devised a whole chart with risk and protective factors with points. And I followed for five years some of the worst malnourished. I did a longitudinal study showing catch-up growth. And now, let me tell you, this is another thing of my heart. 
People don't describe catch-up growth during pubertal growth, and it exists, and I prove it in Brazil. But it was always very difficult to, to write a paper and publish a paper outside of Brazil. And then Mark Jacobson and Charles Irwin and Jane Rees did put a meeting together at New York Academy of Science, and they invited me to publish it. So I published, and it was a very interesting meeting, and I published, and, and because I had published the paper here, uh, I got the doctorate. You know, I got the doctorate degree, and so it was uh, a doctorate and, and I think how important it is the support and to open opportunities for those <laughs> foreign crazy people outside. <laughs> Not everybody is productive as you, though, Evelyn, and you certainly were. Mm. And then there's another thing you did that I think people should know about, and that was that specialized university training center. Okay. Okay, so the war continued and uh, <coughs> in the adolescent unit at our university and with some of the money of the schoolhouse, we refurbished the whole building and now the university has an uh, outpatient. We have 10 examining rooms, multidisciplinary, nutritionists, uh, a dentist, uh, social worker, psychologist, and this work continued, and we got, uh, I went for a Kellogg grant, and I got a Kellogg grant to refurbish the unit, and we got a nice money, and so the university started looking, teenagers were there, and then Pan American Health Organization gave us the support and suddenly, Dr. Thomas Silver, <laughs> where is Dr. Thomas Silver? He's not here. Anyway, Thomas Silver suddenly came to Rio de Janeiro in a Pan American Health Organization. Uh, and he had a meeting with all of us. And Dr. Silver published then the first book the Health of Adolescent Youth in the Americas. That was a Pan American Health Organization book in 1985. And so the work continued. Oh, I forgot to show this book. <laughs> this was Dr. Hilde's book. If, if anyone wants to see, that's my old little book with whom I studied. That was Dr. Gallagher, Dr. Hilde, and Dr. Garrell book. And actually, and he's the asked. three first presidents of SAM. So it's Gallagher, Heald, and then Garrell were our first three. They published this book. And so I, I, I okay, so this was a book. <coughs> anyway, so because of the books, and then Dr. Silber, and so the adolescent, well, times went by. The adolescent health unit in Rio de Janeiro is now the pioneer unit with the Santa Casa Hospital where Veronica worked at the University of Sao Paulo. There are three units. And now, well, there was a whole work in Brazil. Now we have adolescent health units all over the country. We have 27 states. Every state has an adolescent group. We have the work that we started, um, you know, in 1985 continue. We now had the 10th, 10th Congress, 10th Congress that happened in Florianopolis. The work continues and some of you came to visit me, Dr. McKenzie and Dr. David Bennett came out to visit me. I had, I worked with street youth and <laughs> And can I tell you something funny? Sure. Uh, we have time? We have time. So 
there was a whole meeting, an international pediatric uh, meeting, and I had this like, wonderful idea <laughs> to do the street use, you know, street use HIV, was starting the HIV, and we invited some of the guest speakers, Dr. Mackenzie. <laughs> so Mackenzie said, yes, I'll come, I'll talk. Are they going to pay for the travel grant? I said, I hope we so. So he was so nice, and he paid forward. <laughs> but people wouldn't give the money back to him. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so I was getting furious with that guy. So suddenly I said, you can't do that to me. You have to give back. <laughs> The money for doctor, because he paid his own. So he put me and Dr. Mackenzie in a room. Do you remember that? And he opened a drawer. Remember that? <laughs> and put Full out the of dollars. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> full of a drawer. Full of money. He said how much it was, Dr. Mackenzie. And he gave like this. And who was this? Oh my gosh, who was this? Who did this? Forget about that. Was a pediatric friend. Oh my goodness. Fernando Olinto. She knows. Anyway, so we had lots of adventures, you know, in so, Brazil. But so things moved. So, things Evelyn, moved. what are you focusing on now? And what are you working on for your future? What do you want to do? Okay, well, what happened is I was supposed to retire last year after 30 years of the university, and then I start working a new field that's the digital world. So digital world is here, and again, I send Sam Lee serve an email, and so I learned that Dr. Michael Rich was working with that. I connected with Dr. Michael Rich. Dr. Michael Rich came to Brazil, and we produced a new book called Digital Generation, this is a Brazil book, and because of that, I organized the first international meeting on the digital world in teenagers in Rio last year, and I said, okay, now I'm going to retire. And then, instead of being retired, I was promoted. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Now, finally, I'm an associate professor at the university, and because I'm doing this, I'm doing also telemedicine, and actually Dr. Mackenzie is doing telemedicine with China. I'm doing with all the Portuguese-speaking countries of, of Africa, go uh, Timor-Leste, Mozambique, through the World Health Organization. So, and we continue. So it, it never stops, it never stops. But those are the plans. I, I think now we are connecting with video conference. Brazil, I don't know if you all know about this. Brazil has right now one of the best telemedicine network. Uh, it's comparable to, uh, to India, by the way, to India. India and, and, and Brazil. And uh, I, every other week I link with 70 uh, universities all around Brazil with a team, and we talk uh, about AIDS, dengue fever, malnutrition, health rights, whatever. I always bring some of the topics of adolescence, and so this has been growing, growing, growing. <laughs> now we are connecting with other countries. We had a... Uh, uh, conference with Georgetown. I want to connect with Dr. McKinsey, but he's in Los Angeles. It's, uh, we have five hours difference. <laughs> so, but we're, 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 we keep going. I, I haven't stopped There's yet. no doubt that you will keep going, uh, <laughs> Evelyn. I have no question. I want to open this up now to our audience, but I want to remind all of you, this is a young woman from a foreign country compared to the United States who writes to the biggest name in adolescent <laughs> medicine in the country, connects with him. Dr. Gallagher had stepped down at that point, and Bob Maslin, 
who uh, was at Children's Hospital Boston, answered her, her letter and, and connected with people like Felix Field and, 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 and besides Bob Maslin, for Jane Barnes and Claude Lee Jones, who's a huge name in pediatric endocrinologists. I guess, I don't know how she managed that she comes from Brazil and meets all of these people <laughs> and is working with them and did well. And she had a great idea. She's never stopped advocating for children. And I, I think she is one with Veronica of really putting adolescents on the map in Brazil, making that country as accomplished as it, as it is in that field. We have so many of our international members who have done great things in their country, uh, having come here and then went back and with a vengeance uh, decided we're going to make a difference. She's also internationally been all over the world influencing the care of adolescents. I just went through some of the material she sent to me. She's been not just in Brazil, but Portugal, Australia, Austria, Mexico, Argentina. She's worked with the Pan American Health Organization, the World Health Organization. She's Jamaica. been to Germany. And of Jamaica. course, she's been a very, Jamaica. very. We went to Jamaica. With Jamaica, Diana. okay. I, I'm afraid to mention the countries because I'll miss them, obviously. <laughs> and she's been very, very active in the International Association of Adolescent Health as well. And she comes to these meetings regularly. So she's a force to be reckoned with, as you can probably imagine, by just listening to her story, and is one courageous, tenacious, persistent, smart, smart <coughs> woman. And very, we're very lucky to have her part of our group and the adolescents all over the world are lucky to have her advocating on their behalf. So I had tons of questions when I talked with her. If you have some questions, there is a microphone that's down low now, but we can raise it up. If anybody would like to ask questions, how about going to the microphone, Veronica, and, okay. and, and okay. asking a question so that everybody can hear you. <laughs> and bear in mind, you are all being videotaped right now. Um, so your question will be videotaped too. I want to thank you for being around and want to say that I owe to Evelyn that I met <laughs> Felix Field first time and he was my mentor in Brazil because he came to my house and we went to the beach and I talked to him and then he invited me to go to his place with his wife where I stayed for a week in Baltimore and I yeah, saw yeah. his service and I think my value was that I brought his service to Santa Casa, as Evelyn said, the Holy House. <laughs> <laughs> it's a private hospital where I started adolescent medicine. And really with Evelyn, we've been in touch since the beginning. And she's a wonderful lady. And really, I'm very happy. And she was the one who introduced me to the first presidency of ASBRA, which is the... Uh, uh, oh, yeah, you forgot. did that for... Uh, yeah? I forgot. You, you forgot, yeah. right? <laughs> Say, it was the first... Yeah, the Brazilian, Brazilian had the Brazil Association of Adolescent, and I told Veronica, you are taller. Go and be the president. <laughs> And now I want to say, I want to introduce, now I'm the founder, and I have a box now. Where is she? There she is. Maria Jose, please get up. She is now the boss, my boss. <laughs> but I'm the third chief, and she's wonderful because she's continuing my work and getting it better and better. And I'm very lucky because a lot of services have no followers. Like, uh, <coughs> I don't know how it is with Winter and uh, Dr. Hills now. But uh, I know that mine is growing up, and uh, we even have a third year resident here. So I'm very, oh, very wonderful. grateful, mm -hmm. and we are really developing adolescents in Brazil. Thank you very much. Yay, Brazil. Thank There's you. a flag right there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any other questions that anybody would like to ask? I promise, Evelyn, I'm not going to ask you any questions to which you're not answering properly. Okay. <laughs> but I, I want you to comment a little bit more of your leadership. And I want you to take us to places like the Distinguished Salsa Seminar, where I happen to oh. really meet you, because it is really fantastic to me to see your leadership uh, and the scope of your leadership at, at that level, at the war level, and this is what I would like you to comment on. And the other comment that I uh, would like you to make is about 
your effort, the, the scope of your work has been beyond what I've known about many people doing. So I would like you to comment on also your work on human trafficking. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, as an outspoken seminar, I forgot, but there were so many international uh, liaisons and I was, uh, because I had the Kellogg grant, Kellogg, uh, there is a- The word a she's saying is Kellogg. Kellogg. Kellogg grant, the Kellogg Foundation, Kellogg that does Foundation. international. Uh, Kellogg uh, sponsors something called Salzburg Seminar. And so I am in this seminar about urban youth with lots of uh, international guests from the world. And suddenly, in the middle of the Astra, and we were talking, and there was Lee, and I, I, and I and she, and she said, where are you from? Oh, from the United States, oh, Dominican Republic, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was trained in the United States. And she said, yes, where are you from? A University of Maryland Hospital. <laughs> and she looked at me. And she said, University of Maryland Hospital? I'm working there. I said, are you working with Dr. Hill? Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I connected really with, with, with Ligia. And we became very good friends. Uh, I o Ligia also was wonderful. I stayed for... I had some medical problems about 10 years ago. I went back to Hopkins. I had a small surgery there. I mean, still follow up there. But at that point, Lihia was very nice and I kept also uh, stay for some time in her house. So, and well, I, I, I'm always very grateful for many people who are very good friends. And so Site for Adolescent Health Medicine and IH makes this connection, and I think this is very important. When in Brazil, we are now, I know everything, I'm also the scientific editor. <laughs> Charles Irwin waits for me. <laughs> we are getting there, but anyway, so Brazil, <laughs> Brazil, uh, we have still lots of problems with sexual exploitation. We are ready to have a World Cup and the Olympic Games, and we are really working a lot, and we produce a whole training for women and girls in, in, with Pan American Health Organization. It's a whole training um, about sexual exploitation, and I think, again, we have to get this as a, as a how to say, an agenda internationally. Mm -hmm. I think sexual exploitation of girls, boys, boys also, but girls are, are, is a problem. We do have the CRC, the Child Rights Convention, and I helped uh, with the Article 19. There was a group of international experts. I was part of that with the Article 19 against violence, all forms of violence and we produce what we call general comment number 13 that's available in the internet by the United Nations. And so we are against all forms of violence. So I was very pleased and I was also invited by Dr. Abigail English, is she around? Yes, Abigail English, and yes. you're also interested in sexual Yes, and she was very nice and she invited me. I went to Radcliffe uh, and with Carol Smolensky, who uh, we did a presentation at SAM two years ago, and I went to Radcliffe, and I think it's very important that we get this uh, prevention and intervention at, this, at the agenda internationally. So we will be presenting at Istanbul meeting next June, and I want to invite you all to come to Istanbul at the IH meeting, we'll have a symposium and also the digital world. And it is related. I don't know if you all know, sexual exploitation is the fourth, uh, how to say, profitable problem profitable. in the world. Profitable. Mm -hmm. So it is first, uh, uh, Patrol and arms and drugs and then sexual exploitation. It's a way wow. of 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 
having the, the money going around the world. So in HIV, part of this, teenage pregnancy is part of this and all of that. So I think it's a very important agenda and, and we'll, I think we have to, I think, let me just, an observation. So I think society for the last medicine and IH doesn't know how much prestige they have in the world. I think it's important, it really, don't you think so? Yeah. It, it is only those, those uh, we come to the meeting, but I think uh, Society for the Less and Health has an important job in the world. It is it's a way of people to be talking, to presenting, to write research, to get published, and I think we should use this this prestige for the betterment of adolescent health all over the world. That's what I think. <laughs> so so maybe on that note is the one we should end because I, I don't think any of us could say it better that we need to have an influence all over the world and certainly someone like Evelyn empowers us to do so, in fact, orders us to do so. So thank you all for coming to this, and I hope to see you next year in Austin when we'll be interviewing uh, yeah, Richard Brown. Room. And I know that if you have any questions for Dr. Eisenstein, he, he has a whole table full of documents <laughs> you can look at and other things. Thank you again for being here. Oh.